I place no value upon literal transcriptions of nature. My general scope is not realistic. All my tendencies are toward idealization. Artist Thomas Moran This is The Artful Painter. Art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. Kyle Ma is an extraordinary artist and a student of geology. His keen observation skills are honed by his geoscience training at the University of Texas in Austin. Whether he paints the figure, the landscape, or florals, his confident brushwork and solid drawing skills expertly express his emotional response to what he sees. Kyle believes inspiration can truly be pulled from anything or anywhere. In this inspiring conversation with Kyle, I was profoundly impressed with his humility. He has studied with some of the finest artists in the world. Though he would not personally admit this, he is easily their peer. Kyle candidly admits to feelings of inadequacy after taking workshops, wondering if he is even a good painter. Determined and disciplined, though, he doesn't let that stop him. He has a quiet confidence in his approach to painting. He thoughtfully considers the lessons he has learned, picks up his brush, and carefully considers each stroke before he applies it to his canvas. Whatever the subject is, he is passionate about painting it as he feels it. Whether he paints outdoors or inside, Kyle Ma is resolved to keeping an open mind. My name is Carl Olson and this is The Artful Painter. So you're attending the University of Texas? Yep. Yeah, okay. That's in Austin. They still they're still mm-hmm. having classes right now? So we're doing classes online now. So you're doing it from your home then? Yeah. Well, that's a great arrangement. Who would have thought this would be the Zoom gen- generation, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a statistic yesterday. I think Zoom went from 20 million daily users to 200 million daily users. <laughs> and and then they did the, um, there were some issues with security and encryption and things like that. But uh, thankfully they were very responsive to the criticism there. I guess they just had some growing pains, but they immediately jumped on it and, and started mm-hmm. fixing it. So I think that's great. I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you'll be going into class a little over an hour from now. And what mm-hmm. are you, what are you studying? Geology. Geology. What made you decide yeah. geology? Well, it's because I like, I like science and I like nature and, and then also geology. It's a lot about observation. And so that has a lot of applications in painting. Do you get out in the field a good bit with that? Yeah. Um, we, we have field trips on weekends and we, we go around different parts of Texas and, and we do like different projects on like we take measurements and we, and we do these look at different rock units and write descriptions on them. Do you do field, field sketches yeah. as well? Yeah. That is neat. I just, I just got a book the other day. It's called uh, Geological Field Sketches and Illustrations, A Practical Guide. It's for geology students. <laughs> and I thought, well, that, that ought to be interesting to check out because I'll learn a little bit about geology and, and see their approach to, to sketching. Do they require yeah. you to, to use a textbook like that? Or how do they teach you to, or students? To, I mean, you're a good artist, but I, I just wondered the other students that may not have your background. How how are they taught to to make good sketches of what they observe? Well, um, we just we we go out there and we we find find out the proportions, like how how thick a certain layer is and then how wide it stretches, and we just we match it in our in our sketch and we we put in compass directions and and then we just try and ma- match all the 
shapes of these different rocks and rock units over to our sketch. So it's not really in, intended to make a nice drawing, but then more like just accurately represent where things are, which is a big part of painting, but I think that just requires a little bit of training. Yeah, their their goal is a little different. I mean, otherwise they'd just yeah. be, they'd be just taking a bunch of photos, but photos mm-hmm. don't tell a geologist the subtle details. Yeah, a lot of it is more symbolic, like to re- represent a cer- certain rock. We we have certain symbols for them. I love looking at old topographical maps from the geo- the early days of the geological survey. I love to see the um, the drawings where they. They started learning about the stratifications of different rock types. And those are some of the most beautiful drawings. They weren't intended to be art, but they end up being art. You said that it improves your skills of observation. So let's, let's, uh, let's expand on that a little bit. So in, in geology, we, we have to use observations and then turn them into interpretations by combining that with knowledge and I'll just give an example. And so when we're, let's say we're looking at a piece of granite. So how do we know that that is actually a piece of granite? Well, we can look at the individual grains of minerals. And, and then, so you might be familiar with how granite looks. Maybe a, a big part of it looks pink. And then that would be the grains of potassium feldspar and then some bits of black, maybe white, and then some of uh, some like grayish clear mineral. And so as geologists, we kind of developed this visual library of how each of these minerals look. And we, we look at all the mineral compositions. And then after that, we determine the average size of each of these mineral grains. And so granite is, go- is going to be fairly coarse grain because it was cooled slowly. So the, these crystals have more time to, to grow into these larger grains. And so we can base this observation of the percentages and types of minerals and the grain size. And we say, okay, this is granite. We then look, look at it. And so like, okay, we have this area, we, we see granite over here, and then somewhere else, we see an, another type of rock. Maybe there's a type of metamorphic rock, which basically means when so- something is altered by heat and pressure. So let's say somewhere else we see nice. We have that here in Georgia where there's, there's granite, but it has been changed, and it's called nice, like you just said, yeah. It's a nice rock. Yeah. So, ah. <laughs> Where I live is underlain with nice. That's all it is, is nice around here. Nice and very schist. Yeah. So this, these different names of these metamorphic rocks, they are they're de- determined by uh, what we call the metamorphic grade, which is the amount of heat and pressure something has been through. And in different geological em- environments, we, we can have different conditions. Like sometimes we have um, high heat and low pressure and then sometimes we get we get the opposite but we have this same thing in texas as well we we have this this area called the lano uplift and and then for those of you in texas you might be familiar with the enchanted rock that is a big area that's exposed from the lano uplift and then in the surrounding areas you have a lot of nice and schist and so through radiometric dating we determined that this Lano uplift is around 1 to 1.3 billion years old. And so there likely has been uh, some kind of plate boundary during that time. And so that that power of observation really uh, gives you a sense of a story that's developed. In this case, a story of, of the formation of the earth and how things came about. Yeah, for sure. How does this translate to a painting? How, how do you take that same skill and use it for painting? What's the benefits? Well, the benefit is in in painting, it's really the exact same process. We because we're we're painting something two dimensional, and 
but then we're we're looking out at something that's three dimensional. We had to come up with a way to gather all the information we need from seeing it firsthand, and then figuring out a way to put it on canvas. For instance, we might we might say, okay, so how how do we and capture death. And so we, we, ha- we have to go out and observe and then combine these ob- observations with knowledge. And so we, we know we have knowledge about how the way light scatters. And so that's why a lot of times some um, the things in the distance are look more bluish. And then we, and then we can use, use that. And then we, we either confirm or or deny it with our observation and then and we can translate it over to our own painting. Did you say uh, we can either confirm or deny it? Yes. So what yes. what would be a case of denying an observation? So well I I will say that our understanding of the earth or the the universe is not complete. So we can't explain every scenario yet. So we have to keep an open mind and not let what we think we know cloud our judgment. And a good example might be we think things are going to get cooler in in the distance, but then because of a certain atmospheric condition, maybe there's a lot of haze or maybe it's maybe there's sunrise or sunset that we don't see that phenomenon and we we have to pick up on that as well and not be let our idea of things get cooler as they recede affect our judgment. So we don't always just go and automatically grab a cool blue for something that's Correct. receding. Yes. Okay. That's a good lesson. And that was a unique way that you put it. I've never heard that expressed that way. So um, nice. I like that. Thank you. So when you go about thinking about what you're going to paint, how do you select what you want to ex- to uh, express on paint? Well, so I have two very different processes when I'm when I'm going out versus when I'm doing a studio painting. I'll first talk about my process when I when I go out and okay. I like to quote something from an interview I heard from Phil Myers. He's the he he was the principal French horn player of the New York Philharmonic. And he talked about going into the performance Rather than keep think, thinking about okay, what what do I need to do? He just let for for a moment. He just kind of lets go and let his mind not think too much, and then go into the per- performance with an open mind, basically. And so, when I go out, that's basically my process is to not think too much about what I'm going to paint. A lot of it is just relying on intuition and l- looking out and f- figuring out what I like best and to f- determine what I'm going to do a painting of. But then in the studio, I have an almost a complete opposite. In the studio, I usually have some kind of concept in mind and I look for field sketches or photographs that will help get that idea across. I guess it would be like, let's say if I was looking for a diamond and all that granite that we were talking about earlier, mm-hmm. first of all, we'll never find that. We'll never find the diamond in the granite, <laughs> right? Correct. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're so focused on this one thing that we want that we don't see the tourmaline and the quartz crystals and the, and the mica crystals and all these different things that could be found in a pegmatite that's inside of granite. We will never see those things because we're so focused on that one thing. So uh, if, if I'm hearing you correctly. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. You're, you're loosening up your mind to just, okay, eyeballs be on the alert. There may be something really interesting here that'll catch my fancy to paint. Yeah. And then when I, when I come back, if we want to continue on this, this um, geology analogy here, we, we can say, okay, so now that we've We've collect, collected sam- samples of granite and then samples of different minerals like the quartz, the mica, the feldspars. And there was some, some kind of prop, geologic problem that we wanted to solve. And, and so we, we might then say, okay, so, so we, we need to 
look at this granite closer to 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 fig, figure out more about the properties of the minerals we find in there, and so we might create a thin section, look at it in the microscope. So then it becomes more goal oriented. So in the studio, you're thinking, uh, you said the process is different there. You're looking at photos and and uh, field sketches to help crystallize an idea. So let's talk about that creating the idea on on your canvas there. What what factors do you take into consideration in designing your painting? Well, when I did design my painting, I think the first first thing to do is to figure out what concepts I I want to express. I might do these um like five five by seven paintings and to quick quickly get some ideas out there. And so I I just try and think of okay, so is there a certain maybe a cert, certain type of lighting, a certain type of mood that I, I want to express, or if there is something special about a certain subject that I, I want to express. And so I for, formulate ideas that, a couple of different ideas that I think might express the idea I have in mind. And then I will fig, figure out, okay, which idea is going to say what I want to say the best. And then I, I'll go, go into try and do a more complete painting. And so... Once I go, once I do that, every decision has to be has to be made thinking about my concept. So it's a constraint. It's a constraint that funnels you in the right direction to be successful. Yes, okay, exactly. All right. So let's say I I want to do a painting where it's about light and shadow. So now I I have to tell myself, okay, everything in this painting. It has to be clear whether whether it's in light or if it's in shadow, and I can't have an, anything that looks like they might be in between or unclear. And so that also might mean I have to sacrifice certain elements, such as if I if I see a very intense color, I might not be able to put it in as that intense if I want to fit it in the context of the right type of light. concept you have your mm-hmm. design when i look at your paintings there's this confidence to it how, how do you develop those confident brush strokes <laughs> whereas we're sitting here fiddling you know we're fiddling and trying to figure out how to make uh-huh. this work but you seem to have a, a a very confident application of brush strokes yeah so confidence that's something that's that's going to going to need to come from experience and and then through experience i would i would say if you're afraid to do something in your painting think think about the worst case scenario so you think everybody's gonna laugh at me everybody's gonna laugh at me (laughs) (laughs) right so if you there's there's this painting right let's say you're you're in the studio and nobody can see me there and you're you're thinking about like, okay, should I put this down? Should I not? And so, okay, so if I if I put this down, wh- the worst case scenario, okay, I ruined this painting. Well, it's not that bad because you ruined this painting. You you don't have to show it to anyone, and everyone does bad paintings. So with with that in mind, I think that's gonna that's gonna make make it a little easier to to make a few more bold decisions and once you make that a habit you're gonna slowly develop your confidence and also an- another thing i would i see a lot is kind of re- related to confidence is it's just lack of commitment when you put something down oh that and hurt that hurt <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> lack of commitment so i gotta work on my commitment uh, here 
Explain, explain. Yeah. So this com- commitment thing, a very good example that I see is you're, you're painting something and and then you, you have a shape and then you have another shape next to it. And you never fully push this one color shape all the way to that edge. You kind of let it lose intensity as you approach the edge and it, and it starts to maybe change color or change, change values where, where it shouldn't. And I can compare it to that of music, except like think about someone singing, but then at the end of their end of every note, then the sound starts to lose intensity and then, and then it, it goes flat. And Ooh, yeah, so, yeah. so that's something you really want to avoid. And so the, the way to do it is first, first of all, work on the fun, fundamentals so that especially drawing, you have to know exactly where you want to put everything. And that has to be based from a very solid foundation in drawing. And once you have that, then you can have, have the confidence to commit these shapes all the way because you know exactly where you want to end this and you, you know exactly when you want, where you want this other shape to begin. You seem to have mastered that very nicely. I, when I look at your gallery, I see, I see urban scenes, architectural scenes, lots of florals. Uh, the, the florals are just incredible. I guess I'm thinking about florals because it's spring here in Georgia and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, everything is beginning to flower and I love this time of year. So I'm, I think about the florals and, and you seem to capture that, that spring feel in, in your florals. You have figurative works, you have animals, it, it, quite a variety of, of subjects, and yet they all seem to make a cohesive whole there. You, you, you have demonstrated that co- commitment and confidence in each of these paintings. You're really adept at all these different subject matters. Thank you. Well, I think all these different subjects, they're all just using the same principles, and it's just sometimes applying them in slightly different ways and sometimes certain subjects if you if you have a cer- certain weakness it's going to show up more in a certain subject than another and so i think it's a good way to make sure you that your skill set is well rounded well we're working on that <laughs> <laughs> We're working on that. So you, but you mentioned the fundamentals. So I guess that's what we have to master uh, first. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would be the fundamentals to you? What do you think are the things that we need to master? Most important thing is drawing. And so with drawing, I mean, being able to get all the shapes, proportions and angles accurate in order to master that you have to learn learn how to do measurements. And a, a lot of it is like solving a puzzle. And the di- difficulty is not necessarily that it's super difficult to take any particular measurement, but it's very easy to, to neglect any element. And, and then you run into a lot of problems later on because of forgetting to check this one thing that's what takes a lot of practice is to be able to spot mistakes quickly and be able to figure out a way to correct it and so that's drawing that can be really hard to do because i i I don't know if someone i mean you have to develop an eye you have to know okay what is correct and what isn't and you have to have a good feedback loop i think because sometimes our, our, our well-meaning friends and families will say, oh, that looks great. And you just drew a portrait of uh, Brad uh, Pitt, but it looks more like, um, I don't know, somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and that's where, um, that's where knowledge with things like perspective is, it's going to really help you out because if you, if you, maybe forget to measure something, but then you understand this concept of perspective. You can, you can more easily spot that some, something in your painting looks 
out of perspective and then be able to say, okay, now I need to go back and check. And same thing with painting, let's say you're painting a person. And so you have this basic idea of the human proportions and we're on average where things usually should be. And in that way, you can look look at your painting and and say, okay, um, this eye maybe looks really big, and so I'm go I'm going to check with my model and and say, okay, is this model's eye actually as big as what I have down here? One of the goals that painters have is to paint more loosely, and sometimes mm-hmm. I I get the feeling that painting more loosely seems the idea is to that that would negate drawing skills because you can kind of hide it with a uh, a sloppy brush stroke here and there. I mean, as is, what do you think about that? Well, I, I will say that so b- before I, I developed uh, my, my drawing skills, I had al- already done some painting. And so I admired a lot of the impressionists and I, I wanted to paint loosely. And, but then because of my lack of, training and drawing what that turned into was sloppiness and then you too huh and we can <laughs> yeah i'm glad <laughs> okay so how did you grow out of that <laughs> so i think this is just this is gonna bring bring back to the idea of commitment and when i when i think of paint painting loosely I would say part part of it is maybe having a little less detail on, in your painting. But, but now that means what, whatever you, you, you put in has to be absolutely accurate. I'm going to ex- explain it with another analogy. Let's t- talk about a piece of writing. If you want to put in less information, think about writing some, something that's shorter, like writing a poem instead of writing a novel. In, in a poem you have to be careful with every word that you put in and not to say that that's not the same with writing a novel, but, but then in in a poem, one, one word that is out of place is going to have a really big impact. So same thing with doing a loose painting, you put one brushstroke that is out of place, then that really does have a big impact on how your how your painting is going to read. Like, so I do like my paintings to be loose, but then it's also very important to me that these paintings are have all the essentials, like good drawing and the good form. So I do spend a lot of time considering every brush stroke and just committing fully to every mark I make. So always think carefully. But then once once I think once I thought it through, I no longer hesitate, and I and then I I just put put that one down with commitment. And I'm gonna quote John Burton because I think he explains this concept very well. And he said, "I may not be right, but I I am certain." Once you thought thought it through, and right there always is this doubt, like okay, so is this really correct? But then if it's already the most, the best decision a court you can make according to your, your judgment, it's better to, to now just go in, commit it fully. And when it comes out in the painting, it's going to look a lot better than someone who seems to get everything correct, but then, but everything looks like a, question mark. And so that's going to look like something that's lacking commitment, as I was saying earlier. Let's say I'm working on a beautiful floral piece and I get about, I don't know, I don't know if this is the right way to say it, 75%, 80, 90%. I've invested that much time and then I make, I step back and I see a colossal mistake. I mean, what do I do then? I mean, how do I, do I throw the painting away or or how can I move forward without destroying the good that's in that painting? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's actually something that 
that does happen actually quite a bit. And it is a quite painful experience to to suddenly step back and then, and then realize that my drawing is off. Yeah, I know that firsthand. I- <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. And, We're in this together, brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my my thinking is, well, because everything on there that I liked is something that I did. And so if I need to destroy it and do it again, then theoretically, I should be able to to also have the things that, that I liked previously in, in my new attempt. So I don't like leaving mistakes on a painting because it's, it's going to drive, drive me crazy when I see it on a, on the gallery wall. And, and I think, I think not putting out the best that I'm able to put out. And so when that, when that happens, I don't have a problem with doing a part of the painting over again. I, I just had this happen working on a painting. I don't do very many large paintings, but I like large paintings. But I did one the other day, uh, a few weeks ago, and I thought I was pretty much finished. And I'm sitting in my chair and I'm looking at it, and I said, "Oh, this does not look right. There's something wrong." And sure enough, it—I mean, it was. I had another artist friend privately message me and said, "Yeah." Here, I'll tell you, I'll t- tell you what's going on. And he did. And I admit it hurt a little bit. <laughs> I got my feeling hurt. <laughs> no, he didn't hurt. He, yeah, it didn't. I, I, it was constructive uh, criticism. I was looking for it. And uh-huh. he made a suggestion to how to fix it. It was scary. I have to admit, I, when I st- it took me, I probably just studied it for hours just before I started applying the fixes to it because I was just afraid I was going to really just mess the whole thing uh-huh. up. Oh, well, what do you do? You keep learning, you keep trying, keep going yeah. forward, right? Yeah, we, all, I mean, we always try and get things right the first time and with hopefully good drawing skills and, and using good observations. But then mistakes do happen. And sometimes you're, when, when you're, you've been working on something for a long time, your eyes tend to get used to these mistakes It does happen once in, something like that does happen once in a while. You just have to learn to accept that and have the confidence that if you do something a second time that you're gonna do it at least as well as what you did before. painting you ever did um yeah so i think so i do you still have it it's in my grandmother's house in taiwan and it is of a still life with some apples and a in a picture i think i was around nine or ten years old and why yeah and so i the story of that was i used to go go to art classes as a kid and they opened up a class for oil painting and so because I always like going into museums and I saw that overwhelming majority of these paintings say they are done in oil so when I saw that opportunity I decided okay I'm gonna give this a try so now when you look at that painting though it must evoke some emotions within you because you've come a long ways from that that very first painting yeah, certainly. I have my first painting. <laughs> I did it considerably older. I was not nine years old. <laughs> so <laughs> I was more like 40 something, 50. Was I 50, 40, something like that? Oh, well, I'm, I don't want to give away too much about my age, but <laughs> I still have it because it, it, it's a reminder to me of how far I've, I've come. I still have a long ways to go, but I, yeah. like, it. I like having it. 
uh, just simply because it's a it's a it's a goalpost for me. It's it's where I started, and now I can look at it from a distance of where where I am now and where I'm going in the future. But you've come a long ways very quickly. Thank you. Um, I do like having my old works around as well because when when I'm painting, I I tend to get. <laughs> Um, get get into this loop of think, thinking about all the problems that I need to solve, and it can get frustrating sometimes. And so it is helpful to to think of how far that I've come. What do you like to paint on? I mean, what's your favorite surface to paint on? My favorite surface so far is pro- probably going to be. The Raymar panel, they have uh, this art fix linen that's quadruple lead primed, but I rarely use it because it's so expensive. Usually I use the Centurion panels that I get from Jerry Zardorama, and the prices are really good for their quality. So that's a board with linen glued to it? Is it like a hardboard or MDF? or? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I'm always curious about what of the tools of the trades. What do you what uh, what's on your palette when you paint? Well, I have a basic palette, and then for every, every painting, I will I I sometimes add other things for fun. But my basic palette is titanium white and ultramarine blue, phthalo green, alizarin crimson, transparent oxide red cadmium red light and cadmium yellow light and a, a lot of times i will i will add in some different types of blues like king's blue and also the gamblin has a series of these radiant colors that i like to use quite a bit and so some sometimes i'll i'll add that series into my palette and so so I tend to experiment a lot with different colors. Experimentation seems to be an important part of your process. Yes, certainly, because there is a point of think, thinking about how to go beyond just accurate drawing, accurate values, and actually put my own spin on things. So that's where experiment comes in. I can figure out like how, how I want how exactly I want things to look and different ways that I can achieve it. What's the most out there thing that you've experimented with when it comes to your oil painting? I would say I've done, done a couple paintings of where I experiment with the composition by deliberately putting my focal point really far from the center and then figuring out ways of designing the painting where the viewer is going to still end up at that focal point and I've recently done a painting of a barn which the the barn is very high up on the composition so I added a lot of foreground elements to to bring the viewer back towards the barn. You've come a long ways with painting I mean your paintings are just absolutely beautiful did you learn this totally on your own or did you have training elsewhere? How, how did you get to this point where you paint the way you do today? It's a combination of training from different mentors and, and then exploring on my own. And also a big part of it is actually questioning things that I've learned from my, from my mentors. That that's important because I'm using the the principles that other people have used, but then I need to figure out the the way I I want to express my own paintings. And so some of the some of the ways that other people might have interpreted these principles may not apply to what I do. So I I do hear a lot of people saying maybe you you shouldn't find too many teachers because they, they will start to contradict each other and you'll get confused. My take of it is maybe a little bit of that confusion is necessary because if you just stick to one mentor this whole time, there is this danger of 
becoming almost like a copy of that person. But then if you can take a little bit of information from a lot of people and some of them maybe even contradicting each other, and then you'll, you'll be confused for a while, but you're going to process it. This mentor said this, and this part makes the most sense to me. And then this piece of information from another mentor makes the most sense to me. And then you recombine everything into your own knowledge. And so I guess that's kind of my, my process of learning to f- figure out a way of explaining these painting concepts in, in a in a way that applies to me the best. That's a good approach to it. I hadn't thought of it quite like that. So you had, who were some of the mentors that you did have? I took classes for about a year and a half with Elizabeth Locke. And then I've taken workshops with people like Chung Huang, um, Kuang Ho, Scott Christensen. And then I've looked at a lot of DVDs, read a lot of books, such as um, like Richard Schmidt's A La Prima, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. This is a conundrum I've run into in taking workshops. I've enjoyed the workshops, but the fear that I had is I did not want to become that painter. I don't want to paint like Scott Christensen or, you know, or someone else. I want to paint the way I want to paint, but they have many lessons the thing I enjoy about Scott is his thought mm-hmm. processes because I love to hear him just walk through a problem. And maybe that's what we learn is how to solve a problem and how to create a solution mm-hmm. to express ourselves in the painting. Not so much the recipe for creating the painting because otherwise we could just do paint by numbers. Right. Yeah. My experience with taking workshops is sometimes I'll, I'll get out of the, the workshops and there's a short period period of time where where I I feel like I don't paint as well as I did previously because of I'm trying to in, integrate parts of the instructor that I learned from, but I haven't figured out a way to properly do it. And so I remember right after taking the Scott Christensen workshop, it, there was a period of maybe one or two weeks where I was trying to copy his, his breaststroke and, and then things weren't looking the way I I wanted. And, but, but then after that period, I was able to start to understand Scott's concepts rather than trying to copy what he did in, in his demos. And that's when I started to see improvement Nice. What qualities would make a person be a better student of learning how to paint? I'd say the the biggest thing is being open to just being open minded. So we we all go go into like these learning environments, whether it's a class or workshops, and probably m- most of us having already some kind of knowledge about painting and you do have to realize that so when when you when you go in what did this instructor say may or may not agree with your own knowledge and rather than trying to um argue with the in- instructor or just Im- immediately throwing out what you think doesn't doesn't make sense i would say being to get the most out of the, the this learning experience experience you should test it out try and integrate what whatever this instructor say into your your process for a while that's the way that you will truly know if what the instructor says is beneficial or not that ties in closely with humility yes you have to not go into a workshop with ego it'll get bruised if you do (laughs) that's Mm -hmm. for sure so you are represented in a number of galleries and how did that come about well i i got in my first gallery which is it's the wilcox gallery and there's actually a pretty interesting story behind it i was 
pretty young at that time. I think I was maybe like 14, 15 years old. I, I had this easel that Jim Wilcox design is called the Soltec easel. And I had some questions about how to use it. And so I was on vacation in Jackson, Wyoming, and I, and I saw this sign Wilcox gallery. I've been there. So it's I nice. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you walk so, in. Yeah. I just walk. I, I walked in and I, I had a com- conversation with Eric Wilcox. So that's Jim Wilcox's son. And so the conversation ter- kind of turned into talking about that easel and talk- talking about painting. And so Eric and Jim, they, they saw some of my paintings. And so they said, oh, what? it's pretty impressive that you're, you're able to do it at, at this age. And so I, I hadn't gotten into the gallery yet, but the next year I, I went to the Scott Christensen workshop, which, which was in Idaho. So I decided to just go to Wyoming for a bit. And I just wrote, wrote a message to Eric Wilcox saying that I will, I will be com- coming over and, he, he had been following my work. And so he, he told me to take some of my paintings and bring them in, in person for them to look at. And that's actually how I ended up getting into that gallery. Oh, wow. Now, do you, you mentioned a key there, though. You, had, you said Eric Wilcox had been following your work. Where were you posting your work that he could see? Um, so we just at, at each other on Facebook and... So I've been posting my, my work on, on Facebook. So he's been seeing those. So it's important to get your work out there so people can see I would it. say so, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're a geology major, but you're a mm-hmm. wonderful artist. How are the two going to work out together in the, in the future? Because, you know, you'll be graduating from college at some point. Will, yeah. you ge- will you be a geologist, an artist, an artist geologist? What are you going to be? What are you going to do? Um, at this point, I am not completely sure yet. I still have a, a couple more years before I, I need to make that decision. And so so at, at the moment, it's I'm just fo- focusing on giving both of them my best effort and see, see what I'm able to do with before I have, I have to make some kind of decision of how I want to take them further. Well, where can people find out about you, Kyle? What's the best place for them to go see your work? So I have a website, and that is kylemafineart.com. Or you can follow me on Instagram. It's at kylekcma. Kyle, you've been a delight for me to talk with today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation as well. I wish we had more time to talk in this conversation. Kyle was getting ready to go to another class, virtually, of course, but he was getting ready to go to that class, so our time was limited together. There's a lot to learn from Kyle. I'm just amazed at how far he has come in such a short period of time. He is an accomplished artist. I I was thinking about when I first saw his art, you know, I've, I've seen paintings by Quang Ho and Scott Christensen and others. And, you know, Kyle's right up there with them. I mean, he is really right up there with them. He is just an amazing artist. I am so impressed with uh, where he is today. So just imagine if you could go back in time to when Scott Christensen and Huang Ho were first getting started in their careers, to be able to talk to them at that time, to get a feel for what they were thinking about their art making process. Well, that's what it was like for me, I think, in talking with Kyle. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation with him. He is an artist to watch and to be inspired by. You can check out his website. It's kylemafineart.com. I have a link in the show notes. You can also follow him on Instagram. He is His uh, Instagram ID is 
Kyle Casey Ma. And I'll have a link to that as well. I certainly appreciate you taking the time to listen to this edition of The Artful Painter. There's more in the works. I have several episodes already recorded and several more scheduled to record. So I look forward to releasing those to you very, very soon. So thank you for listening to The Artful Painter. I'll see you in the next episode.